creates questions that human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. There'll be never another story to compare with it. The Extraordinary is the reuniting after more than 50 years of two long separated brothers. That's bloody him! It's bloody him! I jumped a yard up in the air! You like this? One brother traveled halfway round the world looking for his kin in a city of more than one million people. Defying logic, he found him. I, I do something, something. Hello, Joe, how are you? He says, hello, Jake, how are you? And I'm crying like a bloody baby. You can't help it. Search is over. It is the miracle parachute jump. Within five to ten seconds, I heard this very large pop in my head. And, it, and then I had, it was followed by excruciating pain. A free fall that cured blindness, the medical profession said was permanent. Now this was the eye that I had not seen in 29 years. The Extraordinary is the joke. Actress Stephanie Powers says her late lover, William Holden, played on her after his death. Holden's ex-wife had the winning ticket in a raffle organized by Stephanie. Somebody completely independent of me pulled the winning ticket. And it was her. She wasn't there. She had nothing to do with it. She had gone to the hairdressers. The hairdressers said, oh, come on, buy one of these tickets. You know, blah, blah, blah. she bought one ticket. <laughs> and I thought, what are the chances? I thought, this is Bill's sense of humor. It is the strange happening in the life of comedian Anthony Aykroyd. Three questions from a total stranger. I thought you can't ignore a message like that. I want us delivered three times in your face. Questions that solved a crisis. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight, on The Extraordinary. That remarkable story, a little later. Good evening, I'm Warwick Morris. Jake Mason will go to his grave a happy man. That's because after 46 years, he finally found the brother he'd not seen since 1947. But Jake's story is not one of a simple reunion. It's the tale of the search for a man who'd become lost amongst Australia's millions. A man happy to be a knight of the road. When Jake set off from England in search of Jonas Mason, he was looking for a needle in a haystack. As Alison Holloway discovered, what followed was one remarkable story. Jake, how would you sum up your story? Out of this world, there'll be never another story to compare with it. Jake Mason's remarkable story begins in the once thriving Midlands of England, around Stoke-on-Trent. For more than 40 years, Jake and thousands of his friends toiled down below in the pits, mining the coal that kept this area alive. Now in his 83rd year, half a lifetime in the collieries has begun to show. He started to slow down. But as you'll see, he's as tenacious as ever. One of 12 children, Jake can look back fondly on his childhood as part of a tight-knit family. There were uh, seven boys and five girls. And I nursed or held Joe in my arms when he was two hours old. It's as true as I'm here. This was the street where the Mason clan grew up, but like many families, in time they drifted apart. Jonas, the young brother Jake, nursed as a baby, joined the Navy, 
then mysteriously packed up and departed for Australia to seek a new life in Perth. That was late in the 1940s. Every now and then, a letter from Jonas would arrive, letting the family know he was alive and well. Then, in 1954, abruptly, the letters stopped. For all Jake Mason knew, his beloved brother was dead. But he wasn't forgotten. Eventually, about 1988, I said, I must do something about finding out where he is. I said, I can't stand it any longer. I must know it. It's blood. You've got to know what happens to your relatives, your own kith and kin. With that idea fixed firmly in his brain, Jake Mason set himself what many thought was an impossible mission. All he had was this photograph of Jonas as a young naval recruit and an unquenchable desire. To see me brother, no more, no less because we had lost track of him. And I come to the conclusion that he was alive somewhere. For five long years, Jake Mason sought his brother, last heard of in Western Australia in 1954. When all else failed, he made a momentous decision, one that shocked his wife and family. Was Gladys, I am going Australia myself. That was when I decided. Said, well, won't you be afraid of flying? I said, Gladys, flying? I said, I travel half a mile on the ground every day and come back up half a mile for 47 years. How can I be afraid of flying? Worked in a coal mine all his life, done nothing really, never learned to drive, never been abroad. So I thought, well, if you don't stand a chance, it doesn't matter. So go to Australia, enjoy it. Uh, and if it's the last thing you ever do, at least you've, uh, you've gone down doing what you wanted to do. But I didn't think he stood a chance. It may have seemed impossible, but there was no stopping Jake. All his son Colin and daughter-in-law Rosemary could do was stand back and marvel at the old man's persistence. Rosemary, did, did you have any Fears, worries, apprehensions at all about Jake going off to Australia? None at all, because he's the most strong-willed character I've ever met. And you could, once he's got an idea in his head, you've had it. If he wants to do something, he's going to do it anyway. My one thing was, what is the worst thing that can happen? He could die. And what would that matter? He was doing what he wanted to do. He was following his dream. Was it craziness, stubbornness, or brotherly love that compelled an 83-year-old pensioner to leave behind the only environment he'd ever known to follow a dream? Jake Mason hardly had a penny to his name, but he was determined to find his long-lost brother, a brother who'd last been heard of in Australia 40 years earlier, but now could quite conceivably be anywhere in the world if, and it was a very big if, he was still alive. Unbeknown to Jake Mason, halfway across the world, there was a woman who was about to play a major role in his story. Her name is Pat Murphy, and she lives outside Perth in Western Australia. Without Pat, Jake would never have realised his dream. But when he landed in Perth in October last year, Jake had never heard of Pat Murphy. He still had no clues about his brother, only that old fading photograph and a fortnight to find him. As the days ticked by, Jake tramped the streets of Perth, asking questions, seeking help, but there were no answers. Jake Mason had little time and less money. Both were running out. Soon he'd have to abandon his quest and return to the Midlands. So in desperation, he turned to the Sunday Times newspaper in Perth. He told them his story and they printed it. This was to be the first breakthrough in the search of a lifetime. There was me looking miserable and the photo of Jonas. And just as it was, only a small one, by coincidence,
Pat Murphy saw that story in the Times. And by an even bigger coincidence, the face in the photo seemed familiar. Even though it was more than 40 years old, it reminded her of a hitchhiker she and her family had picked up in the wilds of the West more than 10 years before. He was a swagman, a knight of the road, but he left an indelible impression. I'm sure if Banjo Patterson would have known Joe, he'd have written a poem called Old Joe. I'm sure of that. Told me his name was Joe, um, Joe Mason, and I knew he'd come from England, and I said, that's an English accent, isn't it? He said, oh, yes, but many, many years ago, he said, I said, have you got any family there now? He said, no, they've all died. So they've all died on me. He said, they're all dead. I think he said he was the youngest one at the time. And he said he'd been in Australia then, um, over 30 years, and he said, and I've been travelling for 27. And I thought, God, you know, what a character. And there's yet another amazing coincidence in this story. That character, old Joe, just happened to be on a Murphy home video taken on the road all those years earlier. Four or five seconds of tape that would bring Pat Murphy and Jake Mason together, introduced by a reporter from the Perth newspaper. Jake's reaction when he saw the video was, well, explosive. That's bloody him! It's bloody him! I jumped a yard up in the air! You like this! And I turned around and... and there's about 30, 40 people in this room. Mouth wide open. I bet they thought I'd gone mad. I had actually, in a way, because I'd recognised him. I've got his photo in there of this video. And he got a beard, yeah, and he, but you could recognise him as our Jonas. Jake came out here with one thing in mind, to put his arms around his brother one more time before he died. That's what his first words he said to me. He said, as long as I can put my arms around Joe just one more time. And I said, well, please God, you will be able to do that. Then the Sunday Times came to the rescue again. Another story was published with the caption, where are you, Jonas Mason? And a freeze frame from Pat Murphy's video. It was another small step on the road to Jonas. To trace him, it was nigh on impossible because the things I went through, I thought of all the things that Jake couldn't have thought about, which was pensions, unemployment, police, driving licenses, births, deaths, marriages, the whole lot, I didn't leave a stone unturned. And a lot of them went off the record and did things for me they shouldn't have done, but they, they knew of the story and they were so kind. And, and in the whole of that 10 days, it ended up, he was a non-existent person. He'd never claimed a penny from the government, never claimed unemployment or pension. He'd never had a license, never been married. He'd never died, not as far as they knew. Um, never been in trouble with the police. So there was just, it was just a non-existent. They never even had any entry of him entering Australia. So he was a non-existent person. A hopeless task. Luck and time had finally run out for Jake Mason. Then, out of the blue, Pat Murphy received a call from an anonymous swagman who'd seen the newspaper story and would provide the missing link in what she called the Mason saga. A call that came just hours before Jake was due to fly home to England. He said, I know Joe Mason. I said, are you sure it's him? He said, of course I'm sure it's him. He said, I was, I was on the road myself for many, many years, and that's how I know it's him. And I said, well, how do you know he's still here? He said, well, he was there two weeks ago. And I said, have you seen him in the last two weeks? He said, no, but I know he's still around. With literally hours to spare, Pat Murphy had the final clue. The hunt for Jonas Mason continued. Jake Mason had not seen his brother for 47 years. He'd gambled his life on a trip halfway round the world in search of Jonas Mason. Helped by total strangers touched by his story, Jake Mason knew his brother was still alive. He was tantalizingly close to fulfilling his dream. Acting on a tip from an anonymous swagman, 
the hunt for Jonas Mason continued. The final pieces of this worldwide jigsaw puzzle were falling into place. I'd lived in Fremantle for eight years and I never knew there was any caves there. All that time. Finally, we got to this clearing there was a whole lot of junk about and the man said, well, that's where he was two weeks ago and he about turned. And I started shouting out, Joe, Joe, are you in there? And then this man came out and I knew straight away that it was Joe and I shouted out so loud, thank you God, miracles do happen. Because in that instance, that what went through my mind, it was a miracle. I knew it was the Joe that I'd met 13 years ago and I knew it was the Joe that Jake was looking for. She comes back. Come on, Jake. You're going to see your brother. He's coming up there. <laughs> Tears. Bloody hellfire. And he comes. And he was there. What can you say? I, I do something, something. Hello, Joe. How are you? He says, hello, Jake. How are you? And I'm crying like a bloody baby. I can't help it. Search is over. Well, <laughs> I, I eat tears rolling. I got my eyes open once after holding him tight, you know. This is where that reunion took place. Old Joe's camp his only home for the last few years. And again, it seems that fate took a hand. You see, only days before, Jonas had been on the road, and for some unknown reason, he decided it was time to return to base. When I saw him, I knew he was straight away. But years ago, he was bigger than me. And I said, hey, shit, you've grown. For more than 40 years, Jonas had been on the road, travelling tens of thousands of kilometres a year, backwards and forwards across Australia. He's a man of few words, especially when it comes to personal details. I like to keep travelling, and I like to meet people, you see, on the road. You meet certain people, and they're very nice to talk to. And everywhere I go, I always learn something. Jake was able to postpone his departure for home. And in the days they had together, he learned a little more about his brother Jonas and all those lost years. It was a story that, as it unfolded, amazed the old miner from the Midlands. He said, I have lived with the wild Aborigines. I have lived and learned from them how to survive. He said, I can survive on nothing. I always go out on my walkabout without food in my tucker bag or money. I've never had a cent in my pocket all those years. I said, the hell you haven't? He says, no, I can survive anywhere. Since that reunion, Jake Mason's gone home to England. Jonas is doing what he does so well, taking life as it comes. But Pat Murphy has been keeping an eye on him, just to make sure he's OK. But there's no way in the world he's about to change his life on the road. His brother said to me before he left uh, Australia, couldn't you possibly try and coax him to get a pension and try and start leading a normal life and I said that would kill him he could never do it never he's, he lives the life he lives the only thing I've been able to get him to do is he's got his name and his address and his place of birth in Great Britain in a tiny black wallet and he's promised me that he's always going to keep that on his person so if ever he dies out in the desert they will know who he is back here in the gloom of the Midlands Jake says he can't stop thinking about Jonas his family say the thought of seeing him again has kept him alive. You see, in the last few weeks, Jake has suffered not one, but two heart attacks. He knows time might be running out. So he's planning another trip to Australia to say goodbye to Jonas. I want a final goodbye. If it breaks my heart, it won't matter. 
won't matter. Because the story, you see, you want to listen to his stories and you cannot really believe what he's done on nothing. I do honestly want to see him once more. I know I'm old. I know I'm not getting any younger. I've reached the stage in life, I've got to watch every... And I don't think I will get any better after this year. I don't think I will be able to do it another year. So let's have it this year. So it'll be a final memoriam to Joe and me. Like to introduce you to a very special person. Her name is Josie. She's someone who knows how to take it to the limit. Blind in one eye since the age of 16, she kept living life to the full. At 44, doctors told her she was going to be permanently blind in both eyes. Yet still, she kept challenging the odds every chance she got. She was near totally blind the day she put on a parachute and jumped. On that day, Josie proved that if you take life to the limit, anything can happen, even miracles. It was Sunday, and the sky above a small airport in upstate New York was decorated with the colored silk of man in flight. On days like this, with the westering sun streaming out of the blue, up to 500 parachutists would float to Earth before twilight. One of the 500 was a woman named Josie Spezio, age 47, mother of two. Hey, good luck, Joe. As she rose in a plane with 45 professional skydivers this afternoon, Josie didn't know that she was about to become one in a billion. In this home video of her ascent to 13,000 feet above the field outside Rochester, New York, Josie was concerned about a number of things. She'd never jumped before. She couldn't back out because she had given her word. I gave my word, God knew. Once I gave my word, we never broke our word. When we were younger, if you gave your word, that was it. Her father had begged her not to do it. My dad is following me around. Don't do this. You're a grandmother. What's wrong with you? You're going to give me a heart attack. Her brother had told her she must. And he just turned to me very seriously and he said, Jojo, he said, this is your moment. You'll be fine. The beauty floating in the skies around her had been reassuring on the ground before takeoff. But now, as the moment of truth arrived, she had doubts. My heart was beating so fast, I was frightened. I had the instructor attached to me. I was ahead of him. And we got to the door and I just stood there. I mean, he, he yelled, ready, set, go, but I froze. And so I'm sure if he wasn't attached to me, I might have not jumped. He jumped and I was just attached to him. And from that moment, Josie Spezio was in the hands of God, fate, and her tandem partner in flight. They called it free fall. And you're traveling like 120 miles an hour and your body is circling. And I was just like holding my breath. Well then I felt the instructor tapping my hip, which was supposed to be an indication for me to pull my own ripcord. So when he tapped me, I just pulled my ripcord. And then there was like a jolt. And then it was all silence. And then it was beautiful. It was this sense of inner peace. And I didn't want it to end. While the distance between Josie Spezio and Earth was about 13,000 feet, the jump would take her a far greater leap back in time to the day when she was just 16 years old and realized 
she was going blind in her left eye. I was at a hockey game. There was no pain, no warning. It just went. And I went home and told my parents. And of course, they immediately um, took me to all these doctors in Rochester, all of which had some, all different stories. Some told me I had a heart attack in my eye. Others said that it was a condition that happened in people who were 100 and that the way you lose your hearing, I was losing my sight. Others said it was detached retina. When you come right down to it, nobody knew what it was. As she floated to ground this day, something else would happen that would take her back three years to the day that Josie learned her right eye, too, was now going blind. I start getting these flashes in my, my good eye. And I, I called the doctor, and he sent me in for all these special tests. And they told me that I should prepare myself for total blindness, that the condition in my left eye had now gone over to my right eye. Since she learned she would be completely blind, Josie had found strength in her religion and in a book called The Road Less Traveled. My dad always told us, um, don't cry because you have no shoes. Think about that man who has no feet. I was not able to read for long periods of time. I had to wear sunglasses in my home. But still, I remembered that I was not totally blind. I was still able to see, not in great detail, but I was still able to see, so I was grateful. Although Josie accepted her approach to a world of total darkness, her family tried constantly to help her live life to the fullest while some sight remained. It was this attitude which brought Josie to the Pro Sky Diving Show this Sunday, urged on by her brother, Pete D'Ambrosio. Well, I wanted to encourage her because of my experience. After all, she was going blind, and who knows how long she would have her sight. And to me, this would have been a great opportunity for her to do something and to remember uh, that, that she had done this and, and, and to experience the feeling. It's a really unique thing. The, uh, the silence, uh, the height, the wind, uh, it's really something. And it was something that would be in her mind forever. So he just looked at me and he said, Jojo, he said, you have the courage to jump out of an airplane. And I ignored him. And he... As he said, he looked at me again and he said, he repeated, he said, Jojo, you have the courage to do something like that. And I just looked at him and I got frightened and I said, Pete, I need a sign from God. If God wants me to do something like this, then dad will be home. All the time knowing that my father wasn't home. Well, my father answered the telephone after about three or four rings. So my very first reaction was I screamed. And he said, what's wrong with you? And I said, Dad, now you've got to, I was a little bit upset. <laughs> I said, now you've got to come down to the airport. I'm going to jump from an airplane. And suddenly, Josie Spezio, mother of two, found herself in a plane with 45 skydivers climbing to 13,000 feet and a parachute strapped on her back. My dad always told us, whatever you want to do in life, you can do it. We all have, we're all special in God's eyes, and we can do anything. I just kept repeating, you can if you think you can. And even more suddenly, she was floating in midair. It was a, a spiritual experience. It was um, quiet. I felt like a bird, and I just, it was peaceful. It was, I can't explain it. There are no words that I believe could compare to what I felt. And then, as she descended in this strange new world above the fields of upstate New York, something happened. It happened with a snap, a pop, somewhere in her head. Within five to 10 seconds, I heard this very large pop in my head. And, it, and then I had, it was followed by excruciating pain. I thought I was gonna die at that point. It happened amid the shock and confusion and exhilaration of the moment. Instant pain instantly overwhelmed by the occasion. It was only as she floated further toward Earth that she grasped something momentous had happened. She thought she must have imagined it. Even as she landed and her family gathered around to cheer her courage and share her excitement, she joked about a strange new sensation. 
see, I, I pop something in my eye. What do you mean? I knew the excitement would do it. Yeah. Maybe I'm cured. Maybe I could. Well, I can't see out of this eye. Maybe I took care of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cured. It was said in jest, but her words would be prophetic. That night, she went to bed not knowing that by dawn, her entire life would be changed. When dawn came, Josie realized a miracle had happened. The next morning, I woke up, it was very early, and I sat up and I noticed that my room was brighter and it seemed larger to me. And unconsciously, I covered up my good eye and I could see. I say, when I think about it now, I still get a little... I pretended it didn't happen. I think fright came over me again. I got in the shower. And I immediately covered up my eye, and I stood there, and I saw everything. I saw the shampoo, the soap. Now, this was the eye that I had not seen in 29 years. Even so, Josie didn't take the news to her physician, Dr. Dinesh Chawla, for four days. When Dr. Chawla examined Josie's eyes, he compared them to the slide of her left eye taken only a week before her parachute jump. The left eye had been totally blind since she was 16, but now it was clear, healthy. The difference was dramatic. Dr. Chawla had no explanation other than that something in the way Josie fell apparently popped the blockage that had sent her blind. For Josie, the answer is more simple. A miracle. It was the miracle, and that miracles abound. And we all have our own miracle. This was just my miracle. Celebrities about whom you find yourself saying, hey, Aren't you married to what's-his-name? And the what's-his-name is usually the late actor William Holden or the present actor Robert Wagner. Both men have played an important role in Stephanie's life and it's sometimes easy to get confused. The late William Holden was the love of her life. Robert Wagner is her co-star in the long-running Heart to Heart TV series. Their two worlds merge a lot these days because Wagner, over the years, has become one of Stephanie's closest friends. It's very special. It's uh, unusual. It's an unusual relationship. Uh, because it's a friendship and a working relationship that's gone on for so long. Their bond became even closer when eerily similar tragedies struck them both almost simultaneously. The sudden death of Stephanie's longtime love, William Holden, and then just two weeks later, the drowning death of RJ's wife, Natalie Wood. Well, it's a bit of a fog, you know. I mean, I can't tell you chapter and verse, but it certainly was, uh, uh, it was an unusual set of circumstances that two people working together as closely as we were had... Uh, the same tragedy two weeks apart, the loss of their mate or their relationship. William Holden was the great love of Stephanie's life. She met him after having seen him 13 times in the musical film Picnic. I remember meeting him for the first time and he had a smile that just beguiled you. I mean, it was just so disarming and it filled the room and he could, uh, he could charm the snakes out of the trees, you know, he was, he, he was what you expected him to be. He was the genuine article. Together they were soulmates, travelling the world in search of knowledge and adventure. The most important thing is the, is the search. Um, it's like saying, the arrival isn't, isn't as, important, as important as the journey. One of the special journeys Stephanie shared with Holden was to the wonders of African wildlife. For Stephanie, who as a child wanted to be a veterinarian, Kenya was a spiritual experience. The sun goes down and it feels like the primordial uh, 
sunset that's never changed, that I'm only getting a glimpse of. Uh, the, it's big, it's very large, the space is very large, the sky is very big, the horizon is very, very open. This feels like home. Kenya feels like home. Stephanie now runs the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, keeping his memory and his dream alive. After his death, uh, I found uh, my own way of sort of, I suppose, living with a memory. But then every once in a while, something will happen where I can only think that I don't know how else to interpret it, that it's the hand of Bill. One recent experience in particular made her think Bill's sense of humor is still at play. We were doing a fundraising event in uh, Palm Springs where Bill's ex-wife, a woman that he had had a very unfortunate marriage to, but a long marriage, but a very volatile and antagonistic marriage. And uh, they remained antagonistic friends, but they were both, it was a, a sort of bete noir for both of them. Uh, and she lived in Palm Springs. In order to raise funds, we sold a raffle ticket. And the raffle ticket was a great prize. It was a, a British Airways gave us two round-trip first-class tickets to uh, Kenya, and then we had a safari that was laid on, and it was a terrific, you know, for $25 uh, chance, uh, you could take a trip that was $15,000. It was fabulous, fabulous occasion. Well, the raffle was done at this particular fundraising event, and Somebody completely independent of me pulled the winning ticket. And it was her. She wasn't there. She had nothing to do with it. She had gone to the hairdressers. The hairdressers said, oh, come on, buy one of these tickets. You know, blah, blah, blah. she bought one ticket. <laughs> and I thought, what are the chances of this? I thought, this is Bill's sense of humor. This is, was really his sense of humor. The Aykroyd is one of Australia's leading comedians, a funny man, a practical man, not prone to believing in the unbelievable. Then again... I was at home doing the dishes one day and um, as I was doing them, uh, a glass slipped out of my hand and smashed. And it was a glass that my wife, Anna, really liked. It was a present. And uh, so I went to the lounge room and said, oh, I've broken one of those glasses. And, and uh, she got upset and said, well, yeah. are you going to say you're sorry? And uh, I was like, well, you know, it's an accident, so you know, why should I say I'm sorry? And I didn't mean to do it. And she was like, well, you know, are you going to say you're sorry? And I was like, no. So she became more and more entrenched in her position and I became firmly entrenched in mine. And uh, eventually I stormed out really angry and I had to go to the post office. So I grabbed this letter I had to post and went to the post office. Got in there and I was uh, writing on my envelope and this guy this young guy came up to me and uh, said excuse me mate uh, do you know how to spell apologize uh, apologize yeah um, a p o l o g i s e sure yeah okay then thanks mate so i spelled it for him and a little bit later i was in the queue waiting to post my letter, I had to buy a stamp and, and post it. And he came up to me again and said, Mate, are you sure that's how you spell apologize? So I said, yes, I'm sure, and spelled it for him again. O-L-O-G-I-S-E. So I, I post my letter and get the stamp, post it, and I'm leaving the post office. And he stops me before I get out of the door, jumps in front of me and says, listen, this is really important. Are you sure? That's the way you spell apologize. I'm positive, right? A P O L O G I S E. Okay then. Thanks, Mike. 
And this time I'm like, finally, I get it. <laughs> um, Apologise, okay. And I um, thought you can't ignore a message like that. I want us delivered three times in your face. So I went home and um, gave Anna some flowers and apologised. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> it was great actually, then we had a good laugh about the whole thing and uh, you know, we're still married. And then there was the time Anthony was confronted by what can only be described as, well, a series of remarkable coincidences. A few years ago at the Comedy Store, where I used to do a lot of work, and um, I was sitting around with a couple of other comics after a show. It was about, it was quite late actually, it was about 2 a.m. and the audience had gone home and um, there was only us and a few of the staff wandering around and we, um, I was talking to these these two comics about star signs, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm a Cancer," and uh, the other one went, "Well, so am I," and the other one went, "Well, me too." It's oh, a coincidence. And I said, "What what is your birthday?" And this guy said, "30th of June." And I said, "Well, me too, 30th of June." And the other comic said, "You won't believe this, 30th of June." And that was bizarre enough, and then we um, called over one of the staff and said, you know, talking about star signs, and we're all cancers, and he said, oh, so am I, 30th of June. And, you know, I thought, this is bizarre. And we called over the other two people there, and one was 29th of June and the other was 1st of July. And we thought, this is strange. <laughs> and we felt a very close bond of comedic, Cancerish coincidence. <laughs>